There's something about World War II field gear that keeps pulling us back. Not because it was glamorous or comfortable, but because so much of it quietly outperformed the modern replacements we depend on today. And one piece of equipment that deserves far more attention is the standard World War II ground sheet. Soldiers treated it as a poncho, shelter half, stretcher support, mud barrier, overnight cover, windbreak, and in emergencies even as a water sluice. But what made it so impressive was not its versatility. It was its near indestructibility. Veterans from multiple armies wrote about dragging these sheets across broken concrete, hauling gear on them, even using them to slide wounded men across sharp rubble. And yet the cloth refused to tear. Modern tarps last a season or two before shredding. These sheets often survived an entire campaign. For the first minute or so, Let's get into why this matters for anyone who studies history or practices fieldcraft. When you're out in the woods, on a trail, or even experimenting in your backyard, you learn fast that the wrong ground sheet ruins everything. It soaks through. It rips under pressure. It gets snagged on roots. And once that happens, your whole shelter system, well, it just falls apart. World War II soldiers didn't have the luxury of reissuing gear every month. Their equipment had to withstand rain, snow, friction, weight, and constant deployment. The mystery is how something as simple as a sheet of treated fabric could withstand conditions that leave modern synthetic tarps in tatters. When you compare the two, you start to understand why collectors and survivalists still hunt down originals, and why reenactors swear by reproductions treated with historical methods. This wasn't nostalgia. The reason the World War II ground sheet never tore comes down to how the fabric was built and treated before entering the field. Most people assume the secret was thickness, but that's not accurate. The cloth wasn't excessive or bulky. In fact, many wartime samples feel surprisingly lightweight. The real strength came from long staple cotton fibers woven into a dense plain weave under significant tension. Instead of relying on synthetic coatings, the durability came from the mechanical structure of the fabric itself. The fibres ran in straight, unbroken lines across the sheet, reducing weak points. When pulled, the tension distributed across the entire weave, not a single thread. That structural integrity meant even if a soldier snagged the sheet on a nail or root, the fabric resisted opening into a full tear. A puncture stayed a puncture. On top of this, the fabric was treated with a compound that stiffened the fibres just enough to prevent fraying, but not enough to make the sheet brittle. Wartime documents refer to drying oils, conditioning baths and fibre seals. These weren't heavy wax coatings that crack. They were penetrating treatments that bound to the cotton itself. When done correctly, the result was a sheet that acted almost like flexible armour against abrasion. In training manuals, soldiers were instructed to drag equipment bundles using the sheet itself, meaning the military expected the ground sheet to serve as a hauling surface without failing. Anyone who has used a modern tarp knows you'd get about 10 metres of dragging before you hear that familiar ripping sound. 
This kind of durability has practical applications today if you know how to reproduce the original treatment. The closest modern material is untreated heavy canvas, but to turn it into a World War II style ground sheet, the first step is to pre-shrink it. Hot washing tightens the weave and prepares the fibres to accept the next stage. Then comes the conditioning bath. An aluminum acetate dip stiffens the fibres and prevents rot. After drying, a light oil mixture seals the cotton so the fibres retain their integrity when stressed. This doesn't turn the canvas into a waterproof tarp by itself, but it gives it the tear resistance the World War II pieces were known for. To make the sheet usable as shelter material, a final layer, light not thick, is applied. The mistake many modern DIY attempts make is over-oiling the cloth. World War II ground sheets were never greasy. Their strength came from the interior of the fabric, not a surface glaze. If you test your own reproduction by dragging a loaded pack across dirt, you'll notice the sheet stiffens under tension instead of ripping. That was exactly how it functioned in wartime conditions. The fabric locked together under strain. What made this hack unforgettable was how it expanded the usefulness of a single piece of gear far beyond its intended purpose. Soldiers used these sheets as emergency stretchers because they could hold the weight of a full-grown adult without splitting. They used them under sleeping areas to block moisture and sharp objects. They used them to patch holes in tents. And in the Pacific Theatre, some units used them as temporary roofing when monsoons tore down primary shelters. The sheets stretched but never failed catastrophically. That reliability is something you can still take advantage of today when building tarp shelters, making ground covers, or, you know, transporting gear during long treks. Even if you're not reenacting, applying the old method gives you a durable tool that honestly performs better than most modern lightweight options. To try it yourself in a survival context, you can cut a test piece of treated canvas and set it up in place of a tarp ridge. Then just apply gradual pressure by hanging water bottles or tools from the corners. A modern tarp will deform and tear along the tie-out locations. The World War II style cloth, on the other hand, tightens with each pull. That alone is an impressive demonstration and, well, shows why soldiers trusted the sheet with their lives. You know, the forgotten World War II ground sheet hack really deserves to return to modern fieldcraft because, well, strength and reliability never go out of style. If you're someone who values equipment with historical roots and practical toughness, the old method is definitely worth learning and honestly preserving. It's part of the reason so many original pieces have survived 80 years of neglect and remarkably still function today. When a piece of gear is built that well, it doesn't just become a relic, it becomes a lesson. If you want more deep dives into lost techniques, forgotten gear, and the survival engineering our predecessors relied on, make sure to subscribe, share this video, and help keep this knowledge alive for those who appreciate it most.